Hello, and welcome to the Spiritualist Circle of Light. I'm going to open with prayer. May God, who in the mystery of his vision and power transforms his white radiance into his many-colored creation, from whom all things come and into whom they all return, Grant us the grace of pure vision. Amen. We are continuing our exploration of the secret book of John. When we left off with our last presentation, we mentioned that there was a lot of, of background that we were going to leave out. Uh, it gets messy. Um, but for our continuing presentation, uh, we will give you a little bit of background as to what's involved here, particularly since we are embarking on a new facet. So Christ through spirit created four great lights. Those lights are grace, comprehension, perception, and prudence. And of these four lights, Sophia, who is, whom is our subject, was of prudence. Now, Sophia means divine wisdom. Our sister, Sophia, being an aeon, conceived a thought from herself. Thinking of the spirit and of first knowledge, she willed to let a copy appear out of herself. The spirit did not agree with her or consent with her, nor did her consort, the male virginal spirit, approve. She found no more her supporter when she consented without the good pleasure of the spirit and the knowledge of her supporter. Because the desire, prunikos, that was in her, she emanated outward. Her thought could not remain unproductive. And her work came forth imperfect and ugly in appearance because she has made it without her consort. It did not resemble its mother's appearance but was of another form. Now, in the secret book of John, Sophia and Barbelo are not the same. In other books, you know, they have different representations, but in the secret book of John, they are not the same. Barbelo emerged from spirit, whereas Sophia was brought into existence through Christ and imperishability through spirit. And like Christ, Sophia is not of the same quality as Barbelo. Remember, when Christ was brought forth, he was not of the same quality as Barbelo. And if we presumed that forethought was wisdom, well, I apologize because we were incorrect in our assumption. It happens, particularly when reading through these old writings. So Sophia conceived a thought, and knowing that all emanated from spirit and of Barbelo, she mimicked them like spirit who who created a thought who created barbelo and then barbelo who gazed into the divine spark and then looked towards the spirit and brought forth i'm sorry she looked into the divine light and brought forth a divine spark 
And with Jesus, after Jesus asked for mind, requested mind, and the Spirit willed something into corporeal form. Remember, we talked about this. Willed, will something forth. And when will stood with mind in Jesus, logos followed. We can only assume that this is what Sophia sought to, to create. You know, and in all of this, we never considered that Barbelo may have willed herself to emerge from spirit. We never considered it because that's not the way it's presented. So we can assume that Sophia had not perceived what spirit accomplished. She was not aware of all of this. We only know of the instance where we spirit willed a copy of itself, and thus we had Barbelo. And the fount of spirit flowed out of the water of light. This is where the desire came from. Desire to create. The desire existed for Barbelo to come forth. Perhaps Barbelo existed there within spirit of her own accord in repose until desired. But we don't know. And Sophia is not Barbelo. Sophia did not gaze into the pure light as Barbelo did, suggesting that the copy that emerged from her was also of another quality. Spirit was not in agreement with such an action. And her consort, the virginal spirit, whom we assume to be Christ, was also in disagreement. There were none who stood with Sophia in this endeavor, none to support her desire, her desire being prudikos, the Greek word for desire. But when we investigate prunicos, prunicos is lust, which is more than desire. It, it's an intense desire. It's, it's almost like an obsession. It's like a craving, stronger than a craving. It's something that they must, it must happen. Barbelo had an intense desire also. But for some reason, it was not labeled prunicos. It was not labeled lust. It was just labeled as a, an intense desire. Because she stared intensely into the pure light. And Sophia, Sophia did not do this. And when her thought emerged, it was imperfect. We don't know why it was imperfect. We only know that her thought was imperfect, perhaps because she did not gaze into the pure light. She may have been in darkness to begin with. That may have been where her gaze was at. We're not even sure if she looked to spirit or even her consort. We only know that they were in disagreement. They were not part of the process. We only know that they were not part of the process. In spirit, you know, spirit is not perfect. Spirit is not imperfect. To be either one of these, there either must have been someone before 
or someone after. To be perfect or even imperfect, there must be a comparison. And when Sophia brought forth this, this image of herself, when she brought forth the image, there was something to compare it to. There were those who were of the four lights. Grace, comprehension, perception, and prudence, of which Sophia was a part of. And that is what it was compared to. And found to be imperfect, found to be ugly. Suffice to say, it was different. Much the same as what we experience today in our culture. Uh, they are different. People are different from us. And because they are different from us, we deem them to be imperfect. But we are all of the same image. Uh, but now I'm getting ahead of myself. And she named it Ildeboth. This is the first archon. From his mother, he drew great power, and he withdrew from her and turned away from the place where he was born. Now, through investigation, we find that Ildeboth may have been a, a magistrate of one of the Greek provinces, because the term archon is, is defined as an interpreter of law. We're not really getting into anything that's imperfect, unless you consider an interpreter of the law as being on the same page as, as uh, I believe it's in the Gospel of John, when, when Jesus compares the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, saying that they they pay more attention to the letter of the law and not to the spirit of the law. Meaning they don't go beyond the law. They're focused on the letter of the law, the doctrine. And this is in Galatians as well, when Paul talks to them about doctrine and how doctrine can be limiting. So, Ildeboth was the first archon, the first interpreter of the law, the first to follow the letter of the law, so to speak. And in other Gnostic writings, and we will explore them eventually, the archons are also called the powers that be. But Ildeboth is the first power. to be considered of a corrupt quality. We have all of these. We have first thought. We have our first knowledge. We have first thought, Barbelo, Christ, mind, will, logos. We have all of these prudence, grace, and only Ildeboth was considered to be not quite right, which is strange, because Ildeboth is described as being part snake and part lion, not just what parts are the snake and lion were unclear upon, but it's taken that, you know, this is corruptible, this is corruption. Uh, and what's being corrupted is the idea that Ildeboth is part snake, part lion. He'd have been better off being part crocodile and, and, and swine, perhaps. But, you know, no, he 
was part snake and part lion. And traditionally, before our contemporary religions, you know, when they were getting their foothold, uh, the snake has represented wisdom, renewal, regeneration. And in the lion, the lion is not only king of the animal kingdom, but a representation of the divine deity or the supreme deity, I should say. The sun, the mane of the lion is the rays of the sun. Therefore, it is a representation of the divine. And because of that, you know, where does corruption come from? It's, it's hard to say. All we can is we can only assume that the author, you know, made a mistake. Unless, of course, we consider the the snake to be poisonous. And then that would, you know, that would change the quality. But we don't know because there's there's nothing here. If the snake were poisonous combined with the lion, it would be it, we could view it as divine malevolence. You know, I don't want to say divine evil, but you know, divine corruption, uh, you know, malevolence. It works. And you know, this is very similar to. The story in Genesis, where we've got you know, Adam and Eve, and then we've got the snake. You know, we don't know what kind of snake it is. But if we go with traditional interpretation, the snake is wisdom. And in many of the other Gnostic writings that, that touch on the, the allegory of Adam and Eve, they present the snake as tempting Eve with awareness with intelligence but that's a different story we're not going to to go into that but it's at this point to where you know before we had this this single path but now we've got a divergence in the path and but maybe we don't have a divergence in the path but what we do have is the onset of duality and with the onset of duality, we've got the, the perfect, and now we have the imperfect. Beautiful, ugly. Hmm. Uncorruptible, corruptible. Now we've got the duality. So the question becomes, well, maybe it doesn't become. Maybe it's just a comparison or a thought. What path are we on? What direction are we traveling in? Because remember, a path goes in two ways. You take a path to someplace, and then you follow the same path back. So something to keep in mind. And with that, we, we thank you for joining us, and we thank you for allowing us to share. Now, this is the donation portion of our service, and we want to thank those who have left seeds with us. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Leaving seeds with us allows us to leave seeds with others. Uh, we draw upon uh, resources from the Creative Commons domain and we would like to leave seeds with them for their contributions. A brief prayer of thanks. We thank Thee, Father and Mother Gods, for the abundance that has been made available to us, and we thank those who saw fit to leave seeds with us, and we trust that the fruit from these seeds will find their way back. We thank Thee in all things, in the name of Thy children. God bless. We're going to close with prayer. 
with collected minds. We are at the command of the divine that we may obtain blessedness. Amen. The opening and closing prayers are from the Svatasvatara Upanishad. Once again, thank you for joining us and thank you for allowing us to share. <laughs>